All right, Mark. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Explorers Club Monday Night Lectures. I am Mark Fowler, and I am very honored to host you tonight. It's a uh, it's an exciting evening. We are covering. We are going into the unknown and into the into the into the stories that we don't tell. And I uh, I'm very excited that um, I'm here to actually host a friend, a close friend of mine, George McKenzie Jr. Um, George is the real deal. I mean, this guy is a he has studied some of the most unpopular um, animals on earth, and he has turned it into an incredible career um, of, I'll tell you something, George has studied urban wildlife and some of the, they're, 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 they're nature's sanitation engineers, these, uh, these animals, and they clean up what we throw away and they thrive where, where we, you know, we're, we don't like to think that they exist in our cities, but uh, George has proven and sort of shared with us the importance of, of the animals we're focusing on tonight. So tonight is, is about rats. It's, uh, you know, we have, there's a lot of stigmas regarding rats in our society. You know, we think of the Black Plague and we think of the, the old days of, uh, you know, fear of rats. But the reality is during COVID, you know, we all stayed indoors and in our, you know, our, our enclosed habitats and the natural world thrived even in urbo, urban ecosystems. So um, during that time, uh, we we actually we actually saw the we saw urban wildlife come out and thrive. I mean, from coyotes to rats to all the animals we we uh, we don't know exist all around us. So I'm really excited to to um, welcome my good friend George McKenzie Jr. He is a National Geographic uh, photographer and documentarian, and he is now working in the field um, down in Florida, studying the Florida Panther on the Path of the Panther Project. I mean, come on, this guy's living the dream. He's a hero of mine, I gotta tell you. And uh, and tonight we're gonna learn all about rats and their importance, you know, from a biomedical research standpoint, and also the, the, the what they serve, the purpose they serve in the urban ecosystem. But then I also we're looking forward to taking questions afterwards, and and I can't wait to hear more about what George is doing these days. He's truly an Explorers Club success phenomenon of someone who comes into the club, and then all of a sudden starts increasing that research level, and then getting out on an expedition. So I'm so honored to to, to host George tonight, and um, George, uh, welcome, and you know please tell us a little bit about what yourself, and 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 we'll watch your presentation and uh and then about you know a half hour 45 minutes in we will uh take q a and and i can't wait to i can't wait to learn more about your research uh, thank you mark uh, for such an amazing introduction i hope i live up to it you know <laughs> um i my name is george mckenzie jr i'm from bed brooklyn i'm currently on assignment with the Path of the Panther team down in the Central Everglades. Uh, so we're out here documenting the Florida Wildlife Corridor and basically trying to tell the story about how we can continue expanding the range of these animals down here and helping support them. But before I got here, I had to have a start somewhere. And one of the life-changing stories that I worked on for Nat Geo, along with my photographer, Charlie Hamilton James, was the proliferation of rats. With that being said, I will start sharing my screen and let the party begin. <laughs> Let's go for it. So here we are, rats. So one of the things that, um, this is my opening scene and me me showing one of the scenes that we kind of started on and i'll further into my presentation i'll start breaking down how i arrived at this spot and what kind of got me here so this is a little bit more about me um joined the path of the panther project back in 2021 december of 2021 i'm passionate about conservation and storytelling like I said earlier, from Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, 
uh, at one point that scenic shot that you see was me with aspirations of being an architectural photographer and um, jumping into helicopters to go take pictures of New York City. These pigeons, believe it or not, urban wildlife has always been my my mentor told me this a long time ago, you shoot what you have access to. And what I had access to were pigeons, as you can see, and they were my spark bird. They got me into urban wildlife. And the reason that I am a conservation, a wildlife conservation photographer today is because every time I've worked on a story with an animal, especially animals in urban settings, it's changed my perception of the aforementioned animal. Pigeons are some of the smartest birds in New York City. And out of all of these um, slides, the slide, the image to your bottom right is the only image of pigeons that are not wild. These are like fancy pigeons that sit on rooftops and people pay opious amounts of rent and spend money on food to keep these guys flying. It's a tradition that was brought over from um, Italy, if I'm not mistaken and it was really adapted by other cultures right now we have a lot of um young hispanic men that run these fancy pigeons from their rooftops in bushwick brooklyn and that was my actually my first assignment with nat geo was assisting on pigeons with charlie hamilton james and in 2018 this is what i got from charlie um he legitimately called me while I was living in Montreal and he said, George, what are you doing? I'm doing a story on rats. I'm going to be in New York and I want you on it. And he told me to watch rats on Netflix and get back to him. And it's going to be a blast. Little did I know my whole life would change. Oh, sorry. Um, after agreeing to the assignment, I definitely did try to scout and figure that out. Um, you see my bullet points here. Uh, one of the things that really that really got me as a as an assistant and just studying the project we we're about to do was how far we scouted. We scouted all the way from Bensonhurst, Brooklyn to the LES and um, I have Bobby Corrigan here uh, highlighted because Bobby is the foremost rat expert in the world. He's been doing pest control and pest management for over 25 years. And he's the person that taught me and Charlie a lot of what we ended up learning and understanding. We settled on the financial district and some of the most affluent addresses that I've ever seen are infested with rats. I should also say that I can walk down the street of any city, state, country, and I can tell the difference based on smell, just with just kind of passing in the air, whether it's human pee, dog pee, or rat pee. And in a city like New York City, it can be an interesting place to eat dinner at night or an interesting place to get coffee. Um, it kind of stops me now because I now know what rat smells like. Um, this is an image done on, this is on Pine, this is on Pearl Street, Pearl and, Pearl and Wall. So we started, this is where our first location was and where we started shooting. These rats, this family of rats basically lived right here under this grill that you see in front of you. And the address would dump opious amounts of garbage out and leave the door open. So the building was infested. And when I did a quick kind of look and peek into what it cost to rent there, I think the studio started at 5,500 a month, but the building was infested with rats. This is just like the tip of the iceberg. This is 
financial financial district also as you can see it's on rector street and how we rigged this we have this is a flash right here a flash gun right here um as you can see you can just take a look at the backlight and look at the scene and see how it's lit and we got this awesome rat and the other thing that you might not know is my foot served as this rat while charlie kind of rigged and fine-tuned all the lighting so my foot was this rat and then we sat there for about three hours to get the perfect picture um we would always work at night so i would leave my house at about 10 o'clock at night i wouldn't get back until 7 a.m and we just went and just shot rats forever one of the most one of the most impressive shots that we created during this assignment was i think it's my next slide yes so this is down a storm drain in New York City. And what most people don't kind of pay attention to is just storm drains and like where rats live. So we rigged it. Charlie and I measured the grill on the storm drain to get the right measurements to go and buy the right size camera that would shoot raw that we can stick down there. And then we shot a strobe into it um, from the outside and we rigged the video camera system so we can see when the rats were milling about. And we just ended up with this amazing image, which ended up making it into the magazine. And it was one of the leading shots for the story. At this time, when this story was produced and done, it had gathered the most views on National Geographic magazine, um, social media. I think it charted it about five million views on the story that we did. So this was super cool. And this is basically New York City. So the picture on the left has an interesting story behind it. Um, the people with the most knowledge of rats in New York City, believe it or not, are your garbage men. So those guys are the guys that I would speak to every night um, leading up to the story. And I would literally ask them and bug them, hey, where are the most rats? And they're like, oh, you wanna see rats? We'll take you here, we'll take you there. So I wanna say a huge shout out to all the garbage men that helped me find locations that were my location scouts and literally helped make this happen. Um, this is not the same picture that we opened with. This is the second one where we got a little closer and we wanted to make sure we really define, got the definition of these young critters that were living within New York City. One of the things that I found out about rats is that the alpha rat, there are alphas and betas in the rat kingdom. The alpha rat can achieve orgasm 28 times in a 24 hour period. Um, rats tend to live in the wild about nine months to a year. And they seriously only survive because of us. Um, the more sanitary we are, and the more organized we are, rats love quiet, dark, dry places. So if you're hoarding, you probably have rats. Um, if you don't sanitize and you don't get rid of your garbage in a nice way, you definitely will have rats. And on the, um, oh, one more interesting fact, I think you guys are gonna see it on the, the other slide, is the fact that rats, the female rat, once she gives birth, she can, be get pregnant the next day. So um, if you do the math, he can achieve um, orgasm 28 times a day and she can give birth the next day and she can get pregnant the next day. So we're talking about a ton of rats. And 
then on this slide, I have some rat facts and I sincerely, yeah, here we go. Uh, my favorite rat fact is that rats love avocados. Um, you can tell rats eating avocados by the shininess on their fur. Um, the best, a rat can bite seven times a second on a hardness scale, um, 10 being the hardest and one being the lowest, the rats are a seven. And we're talking about in comparison to, let's say, crocodiles down in the uh, in Africa. So the rats are like not too far off from them. And rats live in the wild, nine to 12 months on average. Sanitize is the best, sanitizing, keeping things clean and organized is the best way to keep them out. And once a rat can fit its head through an opening, it can flatten the rest of its body and get through the opening. Some of the more scientific facts that we found um, for a long time, rats have been basically blamed for the Black Plague. And the research has proven that that's not true. While they are, they can be terrible animals and disgusting at times. There are places in the world, such as in India, there's a temple where the rats are treated as friends and like family members. When the temple members worship and make food, the rats are part of it. Um, and so it, it, they do spread diseases. They are, they can be uh, disgusting, but they're not the ones responsible for the Black Plague. There were different things that made that possible and made that occur. And on that note, I am going to stop sharing my screen and let Mark get back in and start chatting and talking to and bringing any questions that you all would have or would like to ask. All right, man. I've just learned more about rats than I think I've ever known, even as it, growing up as a kid in New York City. You know, I mean, we knew they were around, but I'm glad someone is actually uh, telling the story about urban wildlife. You know, I, I really, I really respect you for working with what you had growing up in Bed Stuy. I mean, the fact that you started with pigeons. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, what passion got you into the, that world? Because I'm a falconer, right? So falconers are the most hated people for pigeon experts and pigeon lovers, because falcons are the mortal enemy of a of a pigeon. But tell me, tell me how that you got into that as a kid and 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 where that passion began. I mean, you're right. As a photographer, you work with what you have. But I'd love to hear more about your sort of origin story. Okay, so my origin was I worked in Adorama. It's one of the big two cameras, two big camera stores in New York City. And one day, an uh, English gentleman walked in and wanted to buy a bag. That gentleman happened to be Charlie Hamilton James. And we had an interesting discussion about him going to B&H or staying where he was and getting the aforementioned bag. I knew, because he's not from New York, it was a Friday and B&H closes early for the Shabbat. And Adorama was still open. So I kind of had him over a barrel and we were talking. I said, man, what do you do? You have a Leica, you know, around your neck, sort of pretty impressive camera. And he says, well, you know, I'm a Nat Geo photographer. I'm like, come on, man. Like anything else other than that. Like I work in a camera store. I hear that all the time. He laughed and I didn't know at the time he was with um, the chief editor and the managing director of the magazine, Bill Maher. And Bill noticed the um, conversation. Charlie and I kind of went back and forth. He eventually ended up buying the bag. And then I did what everyone else does to Nat Geo photographers. I said, I want to be your assistant. Having no clue what went into that. And I would keep on bugging him. And then one day he said to me, you sure you want to do this? I have a story. It's going to be on the smartest birds in New York City. Oh, wow, that's so cool. I can't wait to find out those birds. And those birds were pigeons. 
And I kid you not, Mark, all my life up until that point, I took the stance that most people take in New York City, pigeons or wings or rats. Rats or wings, sorry. And I continued, you know, I, I'm like, Charlie, you serious? He's like, yeah, I'm doing a, pig- a story on pigeons, the smartest birds in New York City. And I want you to be my assistant. So you, what they don't tell you is as an assistant, um, you at times have to location scout. You're basically working on producing the entire shoot. So he sent me a list of locations that he wanted me to go to. And then one day he, he emailed me, he's like, hey, I, I land in this day, we work on this day. And him and I walked through Bushwick, Brooklyn, asking people if we can go onto their roof because I had location scouted it, but I had never really spoken to anybody. So Charlie would show them his Instagram and I would say, yeah, like this is what we do and this is what we're doing. And that's how I got into pigeons after doing the story on pigeons, it completely changed my perspective on the wildlife that I experienced. And that was the driving force behind me getting into wildlife photography. I had aspirations of being an architectural photographer and being a fashion photographer, but I learned that wildlife challenged my perceptions and it forced me to look at things differently. And that's what got me into it. Oh man, what a cool story. I mean, starting out <clears throat> at Adorama, meeting a National Geographic photographer, that is a really cool story. I mean, cause I, I've known you for a while and we've been good friends, but I haven't asked you these questions. So it's nice to, it's nice to learn it live with the audience, man. Um, I, uh, you know, I gotta say, Pigeons and and urban wildlife. I mean, the fact that you started out filming pigeons, you're right. People say they're rats with wings, but, you know, people don't know the history of and and the culture of being a pigeon, you know, uh, aficionado in New York. I mean, it's it's one of the most popular uh, passions. People raise pigeons on their roofs in New York City. They race them. They uh, there's, you know, messenger pigeon races and all of that. And um, they're also a symbol of they're also a symbol of animals going extinct because the you know the the passenger pigeon went extinct. You know it's um it's a it's a crazy it's a, an interesting animal, um and you know as a falconer because you know I I, I grew up uh, flying birds of prey, and um, you know pigeons are are pigeons and falcons. You know falcons are the fastest animal on earth. Okay. But the, their their arch rival and the animal that they that they specifically hunt are pigeons. So you know um, the pigeon. If it wasn't for the pigeon, you would never have the falcon, the the, the peregrine falcon. Yeah, and, and so, one of the things that people don't understand also is that pigeons are a great bio indicator to your surroundings because pigeons definitely consume the same water we consume, and they kind of eat things that we discard. So if the pigeons are dying or the pigeons have high lead levels in their blood when they're tested, um, if your kids are having lead poisoning issues, usually you can tell by looking at the pigeons and testing their blood around the schools and stuff like that. So they're a great bio indicator. Um, They're also the first drones that we we had as humans. Yeah. Um, and like you said, the, the messenger pigeons, right? That would bring film back from the field for the photographers during World War I to the AP office to get those film, get that film developed so that they can produce the images to show the war and kind of like the chaos of war. So pigeons- No way, that was happening with, I never knew that. That's incredible. Oh yeah. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the AP has a, a pigeon stuffed in their basement um, he was like retired as the, you know, the ultimate carrier pigeon who would bring f- film in from the field. But pigeons are a great, like, for instance, they, they mate for life, you know, so once a pigeon finds a mate, he's there until one of them, one of them goes, you know, they gen- tend to generally not break up and walk away. And you will never see um, baby pigeons because they keep them hidden and tucked away until it's until they're fledged and they're ready to go out into the world amazing man oh my gosh what a cool start of her career and then i mean what was it like all of a sudden being a you know 
being launched into the world of National Geographic. And um, tell us how you became a Nat Geo sort of photographer, you know, and, and how that developed. Um, so that started through Charlie. Um, he nominated me for a grant. And then I got an email from Nat Geo from Caitlin and Yarnell and Sierra Lean who was the managing director at that time. Um, Caitlin still runs NGS. Uh, she's the president of the society or vice president. I don't want to get that title messed up, but um, they emailed me and said, hey, you've been nominated for this grant and you had to, I had to choose um, what do I want to learn? So I got sent out into the field, got the option to be sent out into the field to learn from about five different Nat Geo photographers and learn a skill that would make me better. And believe it or not, at that point, won that in 2019. And at that point, I was deadly afraid of dogs. But I took an assignment, I took that grant and I went to work with another one of my mentors, Vincent Musi, Vincent J. Musi, I should say, he does amazing dog portraits. And I said yes to that and scared, scared and snotless about going to do that. And I didn't tell Vincent, his wife, his beautiful wife, Callie, until the first day of the assignment and we're having dinner on his porch. I'm like, so Vince, I should tell you this. I'm deathly afraid of dogs. <laughs> and he um, took a sip of his red wine, called his wife and said, George, say that again so Callie can hear. <laughs> and they were amazing. Um, they So Vince taught me how to light and how to do lighting. And because he was lighting dogs, so Vince initially started out as a sports photographer for in Pittsburgh before he made it to Nat Geo. And he really specialized in making intimate portraits of big cats. And then when him and his wife wanted to go away and raise their son, they chose to move to South Carolina and started a dog portrait studio. And that's what got me kind of leveled up to a certain degree where Vince was able to teach me how to light a pool cue ball. And he said, if you can light an eight ball, you can light anything. And Charlie was instrumental in pushing me to do that. And once again, it really got me out of my, what I was comfortable with in my comfort zone. And it really pushed me. And, you know, it's been a lot of, it's been a lot of like trial error. You're trying to tell stories, you're trying to find stories. Um, and it's just been one of those things where it's a constant grind, you know, nothing is given to you, but if you work hard, and you push yourself and you push whatever boundaries or boxes you're in, I wholeheartedly believe that, you know, you get what's, what's coming to you, you know, or what's meant for you. Dude, that's amazing. I mean, I think everybody on the planet grows up and says, I want to be a Nat Geo photographer. You know, at first that's their dream. And the fact that you've attained it, uh, you know, against all odds and against all the different challenges, um, you know, and, and then just by creating relationships with mentors, by the way, we find that, um, you know, I find that the mentorship programs, the mentorship, mentorship is the most important relationship you can have. You know, if, if you have a passion and you share it with a mentor and they take you under your, their wing and you then can grow from that. I mean, that, that to me is probably one of the best things about the Explorers Club. You know, I've had mentors at the Explorers Club, like, like uh, Sylvia Earle, like, you know, uh, I mean, all these great, all these incredible explorers have been my mentors, Don Walsh, Sylvia Earle, um, you know, and, and I find that it's, it's incredible the knowledge that they have that they can pass to us because you're passionate, as long as they can sense your passion and you're willing to do the dirty work, you know, people don't know, I cleaned bird cages for years. You know, I, I was like the, the kid cleaning all the, the birds of prey cages and, and bird, you know, before we would go and fly them. That was my job, you know. And so you have to earn. And then I would go out and then I would study in the field, you know, uh, prairie falcons and eagles in college. And that's how I got my, 
you know, my background in research and, you know, it, it, it takes, you know, actually doing it, but also finding those incredible, like Captain McLaren, you know, he's another one of my, my mentors. Um, these people have, they've learned so much that they can pass that knowledge on to us. As long as we're passionate and respectful, they can pass that knowledge and then we can carry on that, um, that passion um, in, in that vein. So what I'm hearing from you is just really exciting because I think you're an incredible example of someone that pursued a, you know, a path that wasn't necessarily a, you know, clear, a clear path, but then turned it into something. Um, and, uh, and now I'd, I'd love to know more. How did you get involved in the Explorers Club? I don't know. If, I don't know if I've ever asked you that. Tell me, tell me what brought you to the Explorers Club. Uh, what brought me to the expert, although before I continue, I have to give a huge shout out to one of my other mentors. I didn't um, do it on purpose, but his name is Ira Block. He's still in New York City. Um, he is typical New Yorker, kid from Brooklyn, has been doing it for over 20 years. He is a straight shooter. You know, he just tells it as real as it is. And his amazing wife, Madeline. The two of them are also, I am the guy to get the opportunity to hang out with these amazing people and learn. Uh, but to answer your question, what got me to the Explorers Club was I'm a retired, now retired Fjall Raven field guide. Um, and Fjall Raven and the Explorers Club have a partnership where they work on telling stories about explorers and Fjall Raven guides. And I had the pleasure of working with um, two amazing women at the Explorers Club, Constance and Julie, um, Constance DeFee and Julie Wallace. Um, they're my fairy godmothers, AKA the only, the only women that can call me that their last name is not Mackenzie and they get an answer every time. And that's <laughs> Constance and Julie. Um, I would, they're amazing. And for two years, they were after me to join the Explorers Club like what what can I do what can I do with the Explorers Club and I just did I had no perception of what the club was about how it worked and everything and last summer I had to do a talk for Fial Raven with Nordstrom and the Explorers Club was part of that and I presented before the presentation I got invited to dinner at the Explorers Club and I got to meet Will you know, I call him Big Will for everyone else out there. He's the executive director. He knows everything about the club. I think even like to what dust is on the ground floor. <laughs> and then Constance introduced me to JR. I got the opportunity to meet, to meet Richard Garriott. And um, that same day, there was a gentleman giving a talk about following your hero's footsteps and uh, following your hero's path or something like that. I, I'm like blanking on it because I'm kind of nervous. And um, <laughs> it was one of these things that blew my mind. I got to see the Explorers Club for what it is. What this, what's, what's so special about the Explorers Club? Everything. Yeah, and you know? we got a bunch of weird and interesting, passionate people that, that want to share that passion, man. Exactly. I mean, Oh my gosh, man. So exciting. I, you know, we've got a lot of questions now about your, your research with rats and, um, and, you know, I also want to leave some time for, um, for hearing about what you're up to now. So we'll start, if we've got a few questions. I mean, one of the questions we have is what were some of the challenges of going out there and filming, uh, you know, with filming rats in, in situ? I mean, it's crazy that in situ mm -hmm. is in the, in the city, I mean, maybe you can pull up some of your photographs, um, you know, from your presentation and just talk to us about what some of the some of the challenges and some of the strange stories you you got from that experience. Um, do you really want so I'm going to show you. Let me find my Canva presentation again so I can present it. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll yeah. read you a couple more questions. So one is while you're looking up your presentation, one is. Um, so what is the, what are some of the challenges? And, you know, at night, what did you, what else did you run into? Um, you know, were you, did you see coyotes? Did you, what other urban wildlife? And, and, you know, we forget that we are also wildlife. So you never know. I'm sure you ran into a bunch of interesting experiences out there. Um, there's also other questions like, um, you know, 
what how many species are there different species of rats that are that are existing here in the in the city are there are there hybrids you know i don't i'm not sure people know any of this this stuff so um, they're so not so they're not different they're not so many different species of rats they're kind of all the um i think they're man i'm so i'm blanking on this i apologize guys no um, worries man it's all like that one i think it's the um they're called german rats or something like that okay, okay. and um they're all the same some of the difficulties and things about shooting in the city is um i want to share this let me share my screen again and uh, right here and present mode sorry for this you guys are seeing awesome. behind the scenes stuff so at this spot right here on the right this image in the right um, every time we would share a video, uh, reel or a story on Instagram, the building would try to clean up the garbage. Um, and huh. it would be, so basically we effectively kind of ended this rat population right here on Pearl and on wall, because, um, every time it ended up on Nat Geo day, the day after there'd be less garbage, less garbage. And then by the I guess the fifth day they had started to put the garbage in garbage boxes instead of just tossing it out there. And on the image on the left, there would there was a, I call him, what is it? He's a, he was a domicile free individual who spent the night about 20 feet behind us. And he would spend most of his night um, touching himself as we wow. were. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah, those are some of the downfalls to working in the city. Um, I'll go back to this image. So this, this image, image is insane, man. Wow. This image, we had set up a we set up a light, a trigger, and we kind of had it there. And we were a little ways away. And what we would encounter, most people don't understand that New York City has basically two work sh working shifts. It's the people that work from nine to five and the people from that work from 5 p.m to 9 9 a.m so one of the things that we would deal with is people would walk by and try to pick up our cameras and walk away so wow. um there was a lot of being security um charlie and i definitely used a ton of hand sanitizer but uh we also ate dinner so dinner would be served so the rats are on a schedule so people don't kind of so it doesn't matter what you put out. If they know they, ha they have a safe source of food, you can lace this entire area with food and they wouldn't eat it because they haven't tested it. They don't know that it's safe for them. Wow. So they'll always go to their guaranteed safe source of food. And that's something I learned um, during this, that they'll walk around whatever you set for them or you if you lay out anything for them, they'll walk around it because... It's not safe for them. They don't, they haven't tried it. It hasn't been tested. Wow. And this is, this is actually, there's a TGI Fridays on Rector Street across from the old Sims building. That's now condos, if I'm not mistaken. And um, this is where these rats were. So it would be funny to me to see people leaving TGI Fridays, enjoying their meal and laughing and having fun. And then these guys just pop out like at about, so their feeding times were 1 a.m. Then they would take a break between 1 and 3 a.m. Then they'd come back out and then they'd come out for their last feeding at around 4.45 in the morning. Wow. So and, you learn a lot of their patterns. And, and so Carlton, Carlton Ward is asking us, or no, Caitlin Ward, excuse me, is asking us, so what exactly is a camera trap? I mean, that's a great question, you know? A camera trap is something that you set up that you can monitor the animal in their environment. With a, because one of the things that you have to understand this ward is the fact that these animals are extremely smart. They're going to smell you. They're going to know that you're there. And for the so for instance, for us to get this shot, it took us, what, six days or something like that? 
it was one of these things where the rats had to get comfortable with us being in their domain because they're so used to humans trying to kill them and basically eradicate them that they had to get com comfortable with us being there. And once they got comfortable with us being there, we were able to set up a camera trap, which is basically a camera with either wireless or wired connections put into their environment where they would feel comfortable and we get to monitor them in their environment without putting any impact or stress on them. So that's what a camera trap is. And that's why a lot of photographers, especially wildlife photographers use camera traps because animals can smell you. They can feel your anxiousness. Uh, I think JR said it best when he was talking uh, last week for ECAD week at uh, the Fiel Raven store. When you're in nature, it's in your best interest to just stop, listen, and learn. And even with urban wildlife, it's the same theory, right? Like for me, every time I'm back in New York City, I'll go and buy like a few bagels and just go feed the pigeons. You know, now we're talking. And, and one of the ways that you I do that is I literally just stop, hang out with them, and they'll come. The animals will come if you're just patient and you're quiet. But that's what a camera trap is. It definitely it just allows us to tell the story of the animals in their environment without us having any impact on them. So these rats here, there's no food down there. That's just them being them in their, in their home. There, was, there were about 30 of them in here. So you guys are just seeing a fraction of it. Wow. So speaking of, man, you know, uh, I think what you're saying is there's, there's sort of a natural balance. I'd love to see, keep seeing some of your photographs while we ask questions, but you know, I, there's, see, what I'm hearing you say is there's a natural balance um, between where there's, a, is there an equilibrium that the rats have reached with humans in, in the city? And should we be going after, should we be trying to, you know, eradicate them and pesticides and everything possible to eradicate them? Or is there, is, do they serve a purpose that we can start to respect sort of like pigeons do? You know, people call them winged rats, but you know, they're, they're, they're incredible animals. And I'm, I'm wondering from the, for, for rats, is, is there, do they serve a purpose? Are they our sanitation? Is their job to clean up sanitation and to, you know, to keep, to keep the, to keep us, the, our, our, our own environment clean? What, what are your thoughts? So, so it's a two, kind of a multifaceted answer. Um, so just to kind of give you all perspective of everybody that's, that's tuning in. When I did this story at that point, it was in talking to Bobby Corrigan and doing my research, there were about, for every one human being in New York City, there were like eight rats. And then the pandemic hit. The population contracted a little bit until they figured it out because a lot of their natural food sources got moved. We were, all these restaurants that were tossing out garbage and you know, all that went away when everything shut down. So the population contracted a little bit, but now it's believed that they're at a 12 to one ratio because wow. in New York City, what we have is, I call them rat hotels, all those outdoor dining locations. Oh, wow. Provide, they provide a very safe and secure rat den. Like people eat food out there, their crumbs drop, the waiters come, they just wipe it off and falls on the ground, goes through under all those things, there are rats living. So um, even as next time you're in the city, I encourage you to look at the ground when you're walking, especially anywhere where you see cracks in the concrete and kind of like a dark stain on the ground. Yeah. Those are caused by rats burrowing underneath of the, um, of the sidewalk from point A to point B, figuring out their food situation. Wow. The reason pesticides and other things don't work for the work against them is because one of the things that New York City is so big that a lot of our departments don't talk to each other, especially the Department of Health, Department of Sanitation, everybody and every commissioner kind of has their own theory and idea of how to get rid of these rats. So I'll tell you this, the baiting and the poisoning of these guys doesn't work anymore. Right. They've developed 
the kind of antibodies to just move past it. When the, when the Department of Health hangs bait from the storm drain into the storm drain, what ends up happening, the rats use those as kind of like fire escapes to just climb and get out. Wow. So, so wow. no. So the they're highly thing, adaptable. And oh, they're extremely prolific. adaptable. Extremely adaptable, very prolific, and they are the house mouse, which is completely different from the rats that you'll see in the street, is the second most evolved species behind us human beings. Explain that a little bit. Uh, meaning that they have been able to figure out how to get the food when we secure the place and secure the food. The minute you slip and you don't clean your place, make it kind of like not rat friendly. The only way to make it not rat friendly is to get rid of garbage. Don't leave things in the bags you brought it in, um, like flour or rice and stuff like that, because a rat can eat through just about anything. The only thing they can't eat through is this metal they use to make submarines because they can't get traction on it. <laughs> but once they can get traction, they're going through it, you know? So I've been... I've heard stories of rats being on planes for um, companies that deliver our packages. I won't name the company. Wow. wow. Um, but and they can eat through concrete, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Easily. That's nothing. That's like that's just like that's their native habitat in the city. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They 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 eat through it all the time, you know. And even when you see like the new buildings going up, when people are building their new buildings, the rats are building their tunnels into those new buildings. So when wow, the building goes up, the first tenant moves in, the rats have already been there from the beginning. <laughs> so, this is amazing. I mean, I'm blown away. So tell me this. I've got a few more questions. Um, one is, you know, you know, I, there's there's much more to this story. And and one thing I've I've heard one of our one of our, our viewers is asking, have they ever been used or tamed for military purposes or for you know or for you know anti-mine? Tell me about that. Yes, they have, and they can be trained. They're very smart, and they're very adaptable, and they can learn the patterns and everything. Um, it's just one of those things where we also do a lot of uh, medical testing on them also. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like the, the not-so-fancy thing that everybody wants to talk about, but there's a lot of testing that happens on rats. And yeah. uh, unfortunately you know, it's not highlighted or the, the species is not given that like shining light, you know? Right. So in other words, they're doing a lot of work for us. They're doing a ton of work for us that never, it never gets highlighted. So and they have been trained and they like have saving us from disease and saving, saving us, us from disease, figuring out um, how our bodies react to things. Um, and it's, it's been an interesting journey in, trying to tell this story and I learned a lot. I gained a lot of respect. I also gained a ton of knowledge and how to keep them out of my place. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of, okay. Cause now, you know, you're in, you're in uh, Florida and it's tell us about what you're doing now. I mean, we've got a couple more minutes and I want to just learn more about what you're doing now and what organize, you know, more about path of the Panther, because, you know, for you to take sort of this un unorthodox route, and study, you know, and first working with pigeons, then working with rats, then, you know, becoming an aficionado, becoming a not geo photographer. Now you're doing, you're living the dream of every researcher, you know, the official dream of doing, I mean, working with, working with, you know, the Florida Panther and with the top researchers in the world. Tell me about that. This is, this is our, I want I can't wait to have you back to talk about Path of the Panther, but please tell me a little bit more about you know, what you're doing now, because I think this is the dream that everybody has about, you know, becoming a Nat Geo photographer and then getting out in the field and researching with the, the best people out there. So please tell me about this and how it started. Um, it started. So once again, leading back to connections, something that you brought up, I met a photographer named Carlton Ward Jr. And a producer named Tori Linder at a Nat Geo photo summit. I was having dinner with uh, one of my friends, Will Thompson, who works and runs and who works out of NGS. And I was trying to decide, should I get the chicken or should I get a burger? And I looked over and they had one person had the chicken, one person had the burger. 
said, so which one is good? And we started a friendship because Carlton is a junior, I'm a junior. We started talking and then about, I'll say in September of this year, Tori sent me a text message with a job posting for a job down in Florida, being a camera trap tech. And I'm like, eh, I don't think I want to live in Florida. Florida's sketchy. You hear all these crazy <laughs> things about Florida, blah, blah, blah. The whole 10 yards. Basically, uh, short story short is I sent it out on my social. A bunch of people um, responded to it. And then one day I'm laying in my bed in bed and I'm like, huh, I should apply for that job. And I did, and it was, it's been the best, the scariest decision I've ever made. I moved to Central Florida, sight unseen. I'm currently stationed on Archibald Biological Station in Central Florida. Um, we're basically on a Florida mountain because it's like maybe 200 feet above sea level. <laughs> um, but I get to work with an amazing team of people, uh, Carlton, Tori, Lisa, Katie, um, Lauren, and my mentor, ment my teacher, the woman who has taught me everything about being in the swamps of Florida. Her name is Malia. Um, it's been this amazing thing where we're just documenting the path of the panther and how these endangered spe this endangered species is really trying to come back and they need space to roam. And about a thousand people a day move to Florida. People moving to Florida compounds that problem by there's no more, there's not a lot of space for this animal. And I know it's Carlton's passion and dream for us to develop national wildlife corridors, just not a Florida one, so that these animals can roam free and live life. And, you know, they, every animal out there helps us as human beings. You know, it's not the other way around. The, the more of them that go away and get eradicated, the harder it becomes for us as humans to live. And we need to understand that and work at really changing that narrative of these animals going extinct and us taking, taking them away. Like they truly help us be the best that we can be. Wow, dude, yeah. that's amazing. The, the Florida panther, to me, is one of the most iconic endangered species, you know, definitely in America, maybe on the planet, you know, uh, in the top five, because there's, I mean, right now, how, how many do they estimate are, around, are, are existing? Uh, we're estimating at about 230 of them. 230 uh, Florida panthers. Yeah, wow. and I, I'll be honest, I've seen more pictures of dead panthers than I've seen pictures of live panthers, and mm. it's, I always get goosebumps like the other day on one of my camera traps i saw a young panther so it gives me hope it, it when i see two panthers walking together it gives me hope because there's hope that we haven't disseminate we haven't blown up the population like that you know and yeah i mean i mean dude the fact that they still exist in one of the most populous states in a you know and that they are that cunning to be able to still survive and, you know, we've eradicated them from the north. So, well, I don't believe we've eradicated from the northeast. We say they're extinct up here, but I guarantee you they're coming from the Adirondacks, you know, in, into Connecticut and everywhere else, because we do have sightings. Yeah, you know, I can't. And I've had that conversation before. We're going to prove it one day. You know, for those watching, we're going to prove one day how, that they're up here. But, you know, I agree. Wildlife corridors and, you know, Florida, people don't realize Central Florida is totally wild. I mean, it's it's not that populated other than, you know, the coastal areas. And it's, it's a beautiful sort of wild part of the state. And I'm, I'm, whenever I see your photo, everybody, I want you to follow George on uh, Instagram and everything else, because he's telling stories visually of what he's doing down there in Florida. And, and um, it's just stunning to see, but um, you know, it, you're right. It gives hope. What you're doing gives hope. The fact that someone can start from, you know, an unor or unorthodox, you know, place and then turn evolve into an, an explorer a nat geo photographer and a you know doing the, the the most important research you can do at a research station i mean dude you inspire me immensely um i'm hearing from everybody in this uh you know in the in the q and a's they're just they're they're inspired as well man it is we have to you know 
I believe we have to dream big and you've done that. And, and I know it's only the beginning because I, I know you were in the Arctic last week. So don't even try to tell us that. <laughs> don't even try we to tell us that. Talk about that. We weren't I supposed won't. to talk about but that. I, I mean, so, dude, I mean, I'm just blown away. We're all honored to have you as a member of the Explorers Club. Um, and, and, you know, man, I, we can't wait to follow your story and hear more about Path of the Panther and your team. And thank you for studying and telling the story of urban wildlife. Um, you know, we've got we've got exciting things coming up in the, in the next few weeks. But but dude, it's been very I've been honored to be able to to interview you and tell your story. And and we as a club are honored to have you as a team member and a, a, as a fellow and uh, keep out there. I'm going to come visit you in Florida and we all want to follow your story. Um, we've got we've got work coming. You know, next week we've got stuff coming up on uh, work being done in Hong Kong and and uh, the, the the project Avengers. So that'll be interesting. Nice. Uh, but but really, uh, thank you so much, George. It's been an honor, and and keep up the amazing work, man. We're 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 psyched to follow your career, and and we're very inspired. Well, I just want to say this before I go. Um, the Explorers Club, for me, turned into a place where I can go to and feel very at home, very much inspired. And I am so thankful for everyone at the Explorers Club who's been nothing but amazing and so inspiring. And it's not too often you can find a place where they don't make you feel awkward, you know? And that's what the Explorers Club is for me. It's a place where I can call home. Um, there's a chap there are chapters all over the country. So I encourage you all to, if you want to, listen, you have Take a question. A yeah, just go for it. Literally ask me anything you want. Um, I'm around on social media. And yes, I was in the Arctic and it was amazing. Um, yep, that's another story. <laughs> that's another story for another time. But uh, we're running up against the clock. And Mark, my brother, thank you so much. Love you. Can't wait to come see you in Tanzania. Um, All right, man. Much and, love. And, and uh, thank you, man. Thank you again. And uh, we'll see you soon. And we'll follow your stories. And uh, thanks for telling us what's really happening around us in the urban, in the urban jungle. So, yeah. uh, all enjoy. right, man. You guys enjoy that. Bye, all guys. Right, Talk to you soon. Thanks, Talk everybody.